Come on, if you're watching online, tell somebody they look good from afar. Even though you can't see them, you can't get that right. Let them know if you're single today. I don't know. Well, we promoted on social media and some of our notifications what I was preaching on today. <laughs> Thank you, our 13-year-old volunteer who is leading the way and serving. The back right, there it goes. I like that. That kind of is like modern-day L.A. Um, is in, it's in current uh, Turkey. This is, the, the, the letter is written to Ephesus, and uh, the city... It was kind of like modern LA, LA, really cool climate. Like vision in a lot of ways. And it wasn't really written because they're doing anything necessarily wrong. It's kind of like a reminder, right? And so we've seen in the first few chapters that we were, we were grounded uh, in Christ, we were dead, but now we're alive. That's why we get excited. That's why we smile. That's why we praise. That's why we post differently and talk differently. That's why we have hope in the midst of a dark world. We have a light shining when our life is not looking good. We still believe for the best. We know what is to come. And so Paul just lets us know this is where our hope is. This is where our uh, aliveness, if you will, comes from. And then we talked about the church. He wrote about the church, how we're to be unified, even though the people around you don't look like you, maybe not even uh, vote the way you do or, or, or talk the way you do, that we are one body and what unites us is bigger than what divides us. That's, that's why the lost will come and, and to Jesus, is they will see that you are different. They will wonder, what is this? And so... Now we come to the part that's kind of very practical. Now, I need to make a couple of disclaimers when I start this message. I told my life group and a couple other people, maybe our staff as well, that I almost, I almost said, everybody stand up. I'd like for the women to go to this side and I'd like for the men to go to this side because we are about to put on some boxing gloves and I don't want anybody elbowing, looking at each other, snickering, even saying amen, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> we, can't, we can't do that today, all right? We, we're just, we can't do that. And then I know that there's some single people Shout out if you're single. It could be widowed. You could be divorced. You could be young. Just shout out right now if you're single. That is weak. We got to do a better job of reaching the singles. Or maybe that's the reason you're single. Like, you don't, <laughs> you don't even know how to follow directions. All right. So, all right. So, but we're going we're gonna to see where Paul really writes about marriage. Marriage. In a world that is trying to define what marriage is. one who it, it <laughs> he says God the creator the guy in charge guide being not the right term but the the entity that is in control says that marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman the end you don't get to define that the world should not define that for you. So if you are struggling with who you're supposed to marry and you are a man, let's start with men. Marry a woman. Women, marry a man. I know that's not popular. I know that some of you may push back on me, but this is the word of God. We're going to see this today. It is a covenant. And by the way, it is not a contract. See, a contract goes in, you go into a contract probably thinking that trust is going to be broken. 
Why would you need to sign a contract if you didn't think trust was going to be broken? Make sense? So, so marriage, though, is not you get in front of each other and say, I love you. There are worse sickness and in health till death do us part. And then that's like your contract that you signed on that day. That's not what a covenant is. A covenant is a commitment. A covenant is binding. A co marriage covenant is ordained, we just talked about this, by God. And marriage, we're going to see, is more, about, more than you just being happy, in love, getting your life. doing. That's not even close to what marriage is, okay? Now, so some of you who are um, older and you don't think, you think marriage is done for you, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. My mom's back there shaking her head. It is done, right? Like, she's single, all you fellas over the age of 70, okay? Maybe 60. No younger mom, all right? So, if y'all know my mom, y'all know why I said that, all right? So, <laughs> okay. So, here we go. Ephesians chapter 5. The rules are, you are not allowed to say amen if this is not preaching towards you. Example, Sherry, if I start preaching on men... to women, women, you respond. If I'm talking to them, I'm just trying to help you out today, okay? I'm going to be real honest. My wife is the only one that can have this permission, okay? Because she's going to hold me accountable to what I say. So here we go. I'm going to start with the men. So this is to men, but women, you listen, okay? If you're single, this is what you're looking for, ladies. If you're single, men, maybe one of the reasons you're single is because you're not applying what God says about the men. So let's listen up. Verse 23, Ephesians chapter 5. For the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. You can just leave that on up there. Because men who are married... You are the head of your wife and your home. Women, if you don't like that, you take that up with your Lord. Men, just get ready. Because I've been walking with this for a couple weeks, and it's hard. So just go ahead. Don't get angry at me. Let me pray. Father God, just... Lord, I'm, I'm seriously praying right now because I need the Spirit to speak. Give me control, self-control when I lack that, Father. Give this word power that only comes from you. May our hearts and minds receive this word in Christ's name. Amen. Husbands, verse 25. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Men, listen up. Husbands, you want to be the best husband ever? You want your wives to always love you, always honor you, always respect you, always serve you. you. You want all of these things? You got one job, men. One job. You get this right. I tell everybody in counseling, you get this right, you can't go wrong. You'll never get divorced. It won't even come close. You ready? Here's the job. One thing. A husband should love his wife like Jesus loved the church. Okay. So that's all you got to do, men. Take a picture of it. Men, you should, come on, take a picture of this. Write this down. Your women are going to be talking to you at lunchtime about this. Love your wife like Jesus loved the church. What does this look like? A couple of different ways. Number one, a husband loves by serving. Serving. Jesus So, men, if you're the head of your home, if you're the head of your wife and your marriage, that means you serve your wife. If you're too big to serve her, you're too small to lead her. My good friend, 
Keith and Apex. He says, when you're willing to bend down to serve, God will lift you up to lead. Marriage is a call to serve. Well, what happens when you serve your wife? Next verse, 26. The husband might sanctify her, underline that word, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In other words, you must love her by sanctifying her. Now, that's a word you might not understand. Sanctify. You heard sanctification before. Hopefully, you don't look like what you looked like when you first got saved. If you're talking the same way and you know as much scripture as you did back then, and you don't spend more time with God than you did, and you don't, people don't recognize that you're a follower of Jesus, you better do a heart check really quick. Because sanctification is a process of becoming more like Jesus. Now, Paul reminds men, husbands, that when you serve her, when you love your wife like Christ loved the church, it will sanctify her. Meaning this, the way you love your wife will make her more like Jesus. Here's the question, men. Because some of the women right now are thinking, I'm more like Jesus than my husband. Or more like Jesus in spite of you. Fellas. You are the head. You are the spiritual head. If you call yourself a Christ follow, follower. It is on you. The spiritual atmosphere of your marriage, the spiritual temperature of your home, the way that your wife becomes more like Jesus, the way that you, it's all on you. Your job above, look, men, I know what you want to do. You want to make money so you can give her what she wants. You want to have the house. You want to have the family. You want to be able to go on vacations. And she wants that too. Only way you can do this, men, the only way is that you have to be, you have to become more like Christ every single day. You've got to get in the word all the time. If you don't know the word, how in the world can you lead your wife spiritually? You better be praying over her every morning, every morning. God gave you that blessing. God gave you your wife. Just so you know, he, he has the authority. He can take her away at any moment. And the problem is, we start praying to God. We start trying to clean up when the mess is already made, men. Step up. Rise up. Lead. Spiritually. Get in the word. Bring your family to church, even when they don't want to. Get in a group. Serve hard, men. Serve hard. We just had a night for men. A rise up night. Where we're being challenged. Serve. Serve. Serve, lead, lead, lead. Talk about scripture with her. Pray with her. Pray over her. Let her just walk in and see you reading the Bible. Some of the, some of the women will pass out. Tell her what God did to you today. What he showed you in one verse. Some of you are doing it, but you're not communicating it. Let them know. Care for her soul. Care for her soul. And by the way, rise up in church. You want it? <laughs> Every church I've ever been into, and probably you too, guess who's doing all the serving? Women, 80% of them. Right? Women, they know how to lead. They take care of their family. They take care of you. They they. Do your laundry. They're in scripture. They know what the church needs. They are trying to meet needs and lead by example. Where are you? Hunting? 
sitting at home? You, you know that this is such a big deal, don't you? Because you're going to die. Me too. It's appointed once the man to die. So you're going to die at the end of your life. It's not, it's not that you just turn to dust. You got eternity waiting. Eternity. And you're either going to be with God in a place called heaven that is glorious, where you'll be serving our king, or you're going to be in a place called hell, the wrath of God, eternal separation. And you can't take a few hours a week and be with God's people in God's house while your wife is here? Come on. Don't worry, I'm getting to the ladies. Just relax. Don't get mad. Be a leader. I'm glad you work hard. I'm glad you got money. I'm glad that they have all their physical needs taken care of. But what about soul care? Lead. Step up. Be a man. I'm not defined. My manhood is not defined because I hunt or because I drive a truck or, or because I make money. Lead her spiritually. Verse 28, the same way, husbands, love your wives as your own bodies. He, he who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we're members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. My mama and my daddy, they both, they, they sometimes feel like I don't tell them things that I'm not around and all that. It's not because I don't love them. It's not because I don't honor them. It's not because I don't respect them. I have left and I have clung to my bride. This is marriage. Verse 31, leave, cleave and become one. Let me tell you how to do this, men. This is the hardest one. A husband loves by sacrificing. It's Golgotha love. It's Jesus carrying his own cross, his instrument of death. It's Jesus when a crown of thorns is dug into his head. Press down, blood. Run. It's Jesus when he's beaten. His flesh is tore open. You can literally see his bones, his organs. It's Jesus getting nailed to a cross. Not with little nails. I'm talking spikes driven in his hands and his feet. Why did Jesus do that? Why would God leave heaven? We're trying to get to heaven. Why did God leave heaven to come endure all of this? You know why? Sacrificial love for you, for me. He loved the church that much. Leave, cleave, and become one. Husbands, can I just talk about leaving real quick? It's easy for men to leave mama and daddy, most of them. But let's press on this a little bit more. When you become one with your wife, when you say I do and make a covenant promise to her and to the Lord, you leave your former way behind. Now, example, if you are married and you're still living like you're single, you have not left. If every Friday is boys night while your wife's at home. Every Friday is boys' night at the bar or just hanging or, or playing video games. You have not left your former way 
of living. If you don't clean up after yourself, if your wife is having to do all the work for you, you have not left that single life. Man, you got to rise up. Do you know why this is so important? Very practically, do you know why? Because one of, if not the top, one of the, the most important needs that your wife has is security. And I, the first parts of my marriage, and even today, I, I struggle with that at times. It's not about just protecting her. When you leave what you love and cleave to her, that gives her a sense of security that I'm worth everything to him. If you aren't willing to sacrifice for your wife, then you don't even know it, but you're sacrificing her security. Paul says marriage is not about you anymore, man. It's a call to die. And I get this, by the way. This sounds like slavery. Right? Like men, like we, we're just supposed to do whatever she wants. I get that. I understand that. It sounds impossible. But, but God has said that when you leave your life and when you cleave or cling to like glue to your wife, that you become one. It's a promise. It's a promise. And by the way, if you're doing married things before you're married, you're trying to make yourself one before you got the order right. You better get in the word. You better repent. Because God will not honor and bless what is happening. And I'm not saying that out of condemnation or guilt or shame. That is very real. There's good news that the cross, the same cross that's for me, is for you. And there's repent. You just repent, turn from that life, and you are pure, made pure by God. Men, it's on you to be the head, to serve, to love her, to lay down, to sacrifice, and to sanctify her. You are the leaders. If you've got a messy marriage, if you've got a messed up marriage, it's not because your wife has a problem. I'm going to tell you. It starts with us. It's us. Okay, take a breath. I'm moving on to the ladies. Gosh, praise the Lord, right, men? All right. All right. I am not a lady, so it probably won't be as long as what I just said to the men. My wife was not ready to come talk yet, nor did I want her to at the time. <clears throat> Wives, verse 22, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ... So also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Ladies, wives, potential wives, listen up. The husband's job is to love you like Christ loved the church. You know what your job is to do? One job, it is to, you ready? Submit. <laughs> submit. Submit. That's the Lord. He says submit. You, you, you probably have a wrong view of submission. Men are like, that's right. My woman's going to do everything I say, right? I, okay, okay. Submit. Submit. Because your husband is the head. Listen, I really need you to lean in on this. Because the husband is your head, you cease to build your kingdom to advance his kingdom 
and your family's kingdom. Now, don't misunderstand what Paul is saying. He is not saying women shouldn't work. Don't hear me wrong. He is saying that you shouldn't work at the expense of your family. Some women have put more work into their work than they do their marriage. Your husband is the head. You submit. Well, that offends me. I mean, this is the word of God. You either submit and surrender to God's word or you do it your way. Now, I know the pushback, ladies. I would submit if he loved me like Jesus. I would submit, but he's an idiot. And he is not doing the godly things, right? That's what some of you are thinking. I'd submit if. If you only submit to your husband when you agree, that's not submission. That's agreement. Try submitting when you disagree. Now, I'm not talking about going against God's word, his priorities. I, I'm not, if it's going to cause harm, you, you don't do that to submit, right? That's, that's foolish. If it's contradictory to God's word or to God, you, you, you don't submit to that. But everything else, submit. Well, that's hard for me. Listen, your husband has to die to self. <laughs> we have to love you like Jesus loved the church. That's hard. You got the easy part. We got to die. <laughs> Even love God. Oh, I'm glad you said that. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Some of you who just thought that, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Likewise, wives, be the subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, even if some aren't godly, even if some aren't doing the, the disciplines that God wants them to do, or, or not living a life, you submit so that they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Women, Wives, submit to your husbands because you want to glorify Jesus. The godly wife sees submission as discipleship. If you don't submit well, this is an area of maturity that you need to grow in. I've already hammered the husband, so don't be thinking about your husband during this time. When you submit, it's... Especially when you disagree, when you submit your ways, when you honor what your husband says and respect that, you look more like Jesus to him. Your light begins to shine brighter. And listen, when the husband gets this right and the wife gets this right, the two look like Jesus and the way he loves the church and the way the church submits to Jesus. You want to know why marriages are failing? You want to know why adultery happens? You want to know why like half are ending in divorce? You want to know why we don't even know what marriage is? Because the husbands aren't loving like Christ loved the church and the wives are not submitting. That's it. It's not that you need more affection or love or, or you need a more security. You do this one thing right, men. You do this one thing right, ladies. Your marriage will be the picture of Christ and the church to a lost world. The problem is when I say go be a light, you want to post scripture. You want to tell people about Jesus, but they're looking at your marriage falling apart. They're looking at the way you talk about your husband or wife. They're looking at the way you argue and they don't want to listen to you. Now listen, every marriage is going to have problems. 
Can I just talk to the single people out there? Teenagers, the ones dating. Listen to me. You're going to date somebody and you're going to think that's the perfect boo. Like you're going to be like, oh my God, he's so beautiful. And, and like you're just going to get infatuated. This is my man. This is my woman. And like it's going to be perfect, right? You, you guys have been there. And, and so all of a sudden, this is what's happened in the world today. You live together. Maybe you don't live together. But you decide we're getting married. Something happens after you get married. You ever notice this? After you get married, you all of a sudden see something you didn't know was there. You've been dating for six years. But when you got married, all of a sudden this person has become someone different. This has been hidden and you didn't even know about it. And the perfect person that made you happy. all You, you just wanted to be happy. You wanted to feel love. You wanted to feel all of that, those good feelings. And the person will bring you happiness. And all of a sudden... Can I ask you a question? What if marriage, what if God's main intention for marriage was not to make you happy by giving you the perfect person? What if his main intention in marriage is to make you more holy, to be like Jesus? This is where it gets good. Listen, listen. What if in your marriage right now, God in his provision and his wisdom has placed you with a man or a woman who is a sinner, who has a lot of faults, and God has ordained you to be one with him or her so that you will learn how to love God. A sinner like Jesus loved you. Because without your partner, your faith may not be what it is. Your prayers might not be what it is. Men, I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. When talking about loving your wife like, like, like Jesus loved the church, church listen to what C.S. Lewis says. The husband... Who embodies the, this verse is the one whose marriage most feels like a crucifixion. It is the husband whose wife receives most and gives the least. It's the one whose wife is most unworthy of him. Who is in her own mere nature least lovable. For the church has no beauty but what the bridegroom gives her. He does not find, but makes her lovely. Listen to me. When Jesus Christ married me. Alcohol problem. I had a pornography problem. I was hanging out in the wrong people. I was thinking about myself, pride, and Christ chose me just like I was. He found me and I was not lovely. What made me lovely is knowing that I have Christ who absorbed my sin, who absorbed my ugliness on a cross. And made me lovely. How did Jesus do this? He didn't pay me back. He's not waiting to zap me. He's not ashamed of my past. And he makes me lovely. So listen. This is marriage. So, this is just an example. Imandy, my wife, cusses me out. Maybe I deserve it. Maybe I screwed up. 
I forgot something, that happens. I am mean, sometimes that happens. But I disappointed her and I've hurt her. Maybe, maybe it was sovereignly appointed by God. To teach me what I am, what I've been towards God. To teach me how much he's forgiven me. How much he loves me. And to give me a chance to love her. And Christ loves me. Now, Mandy does that to me. I'm not saying I excuse the offense. Mandy can't be like, I heard what you preached on Sunday, Chris, so I can treat you any way you want now. I, any way I want to because I'm going to sanctify you. <laughs> that's, that's not how that works. I, I'm also not saying that you just take it. But I am saying that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we communicate and respond in order to redeem and restore the way that Christ has done. Not to criticize. Not to tear down. But to look like Christ and the church to our daughter, to other to our church, to couples. And I know what you're thinking. Wow, Pastor Chris, do you do this all the time? No. I do it really well on days I'm going to preach on marriage. <laughs> but we get this wrong all the time. And you know why we don't do this right? Honestly, the number one, the only reason, because in the midst of offense and hurt and frustration, we are not spirit lit. We're not spirit filled. We want to respond so quickly because we've been offended. We got to get this right. And real quickly, because it's time to go. Ephesians 6. I'm not going to hit everything I want to hit. For this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with the promise. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Children, teenagers, you, if you're living at home, you're still a child. Listen to me. Obey and honor your parents. This is from the Lord. Treat them with respect. Don't talk back. Don't ask them why. Even when it doesn't make sense. Because your honor, when you honor. In this time, it could have been men and women. But fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. I do this sometimes. Just a push. Do not provoke your children to anger. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Listen really quickly. When Paul wrote this at this time, men had the power of their families. Men could sell their wives, could disown their wives, could put them out for prostitution and slavery. And men could do the same thing with children. They could put their children in the middle of the street and somebody would come by, possibly to buy them and slave them and, 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 and harm them. And listen to me, dads. I know that most, if not all of you dads, would never physically harm your ch children. And you say, then that is awful. But I know a lot of Christians, a lot of Christian dads, while they would never harm their children physically, you would discard them spiritually. You would abandon them. You're too busy to go bump volleyball for 30 minutes. You're too tired. These are ways to provoke your children, by the way. You'll let mom or the wife do the work. Instead of coming home and saying, how can I serve you today? Do you need me to clean the house this week? I heard you. I got it. I don't want to. Nothing inside of me wants to clean the house this week before our life group. Except that I got to lay down my life. 
and sacrifice and serve my wife this week because she's got a busy week ahead. Paul says, parents, discipline and instruct in the way of the Lord. Look, I'm just going to be real. That's my daughter. Her name is Lily. And she has been spanked. That's just me. There's verse after verse after verse that says things like, Spare the rod, spoil the child. And it becomes harder now that she's a teenager. Proverbs 23 says, don't fail to discipline. The rod of punishment won't kill them. Some of you are too, trying so hard to be their friends. Your children should not be your best friend. They should be your child. And I get, I get it. I know that may push on you a little bit. But they are your child. Your life does not revolve around your children. It should revolve around God. Your house should not revolve around your children. Your schedule should not revolve around your children. It should, men, your schedule should revolve around your, your God and your wife. And you discipline. And you instruct in the ways of the Lord. Men, if you don't know the ways of the Lord, you can't lead them in the ways of the Lord. A lack of discipline is a lack of love. I mean, that's what, that's what Proverbs 23 says. Physical discipline will save them from death. I know this is a heavy message. But it's one that Paul knew the church needs today. Men, walk out of here. And, and ask yourself, I've got some practical things. I think there will be a graphic up on the scene. But what is the takeaway today? There's a number line in your sermon notes on your app if you want to open that up. Or you can draw out a number line, 1 to 10, 10 being great, 1 being I'm awful. But let me ask you a question on a scale of 1 to 10. Husbands, how are you loving your wife like Jesus? The way you serve her, the way you sacrifice, the way you pour over her in prayer, the way you prioritize her. Women, wives, how are you submitting to the husband? Not when it, you know it's right, but in the things that are just so hard. How you doing? Children, how are you, how are you doing at the way you honor and obey your parents? What is one, listen, as you leave here today, what's one practical thing? One practical thing that you can do this week to fulfill your responsibility in your covenant. One thing, if you're not married, okay, what is a way you can honor your family? What is a way you can date and honor God? Some of you are living in sin. You're living with your, you think, potential mate. Like, maybe you should do something differently. Maybe God is pressing on that. Widowed, older people who aren't planning on getting married, get your eyes open. You never know, especially at Vision. A lot of single people coming. But even if so, you've probably got family who needs this word. Wisdom from you and what you've been through. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray and we're not even going to have music. I'm going to pray us out of here. And um, when, I'm, when I'm done this prayer, Pastor Rod's going to come up. And he's going he's gonna to say a few things. And then we're going to get out of here. So God, now, God, you, you move in your people. Right now, in this stillness, think about what is a way that you can fulfill your responsibility this year, this week, or maybe just today, to your husband. And your wife. Keeping your heads bowed and your eyes closed. <clears throat> Listen.
It's absolutely impossible. Some people say that they, they, they're, they're leading just fine. They think they can lead and all that. But I'm, I'm telling you, eventually you will grow weary. And that's where Jesus comes. Men in this room, if you want to effectively and efficiently lead your family, lead your wife, lead your children, you can only do it with the Spirit of God. Women, if you want to be an example to your husband and to your children, you can only do it with the Spirit of God. And I believe this morning that there's somebody in here today who hasn't surrendered. And it is, it's, a, it's a very simple yet fulfilling thing to surrender to God. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, meaning that all of us are sinners. Everyone under the sound of my voice, even myself, are sinners. God set a standard, we fall short of that standard. Anything below that standard is considered sin. And because of that sin, he required a sacrifice. And the only acceptable Believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and confess that he is Lord over your life. Admit, believe, and confess. God, I am a sinner. I believe your son died on the cross for me. And I your hand. I see you. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you guys to do something if you raise your hand. It's not something that we typically do, but I'm just going to ask you to, to slip right into the back back here. Nobody else is looking around or anything. I'm the only one that saw you. I just want you to slip right into the back back there. No, don't wait. Just, just move right now. Slip right into the back back there, and, and we're going to have a gift for you. Somebody is going to talk to you. We have this new believer's kit. It gives you the word of God. It gives you, it, it gives you um, just next steps information. Father, we thank you for these two souls here this morning. We thank you for, for the fact that they're willing to surrender. I pray over every single marriage in this room this morning. I pray that the men step up and be men within their families. I pray that they're men over their marriages, men over their children. I pray that they step up and lead in a biblical manner. Not according to this world, but according to your standard. I pray for the women in this room and the wives and that they submit to their husbands. And I pray that we all be led by your spirit. Strengthen us with your spirit and show us your love, Lord. We love you and we thank you for this time. And everybody said, amen. amen. Church, go out, love Jesus, love people, and live your purpose. Oh. <laughs>